Good morning, church family. How are you? Excited to be here? Yeah, who's excited about the good news of the cross and the resurrection this morning, hey? Anyone? That's good. Why don't you stand your feet and we'll, uh, we'll pray and we'll uh, give some praise and worship to our King this morning. Let's pray. True Lord Jesus, our desire is to lift you up this morning. We come into your house this morning and we recognize that we don't come out of our, our good performance. We don't come because we've at all impressed you with our good deeds. We come because we recognize that we were broken and lost and in desperate need of a savior and you found us and you reached out to us and you introduced yourself to us and you brought us freedom and you brought us life and you brought us healing. So Jesus, we just say that this morning is all about you. We say this church, Father, is all about you. Our our declaration this morning, help it to be true, God, is that our lives are all about you. Help us to hand over everything to you this morning. You are worthy to be praised. You are good. You are loving. You are kind. You're so generous towards us. And we are completely in your debt as one who gave everything so we could have life. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth this morning, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship. I've heard a sound. And I have heard a sound coming on the wind, changing hearts and minds, healing brokenness. I feel a generation breaking through despair. I hear a generation. Full of faith declare And our song it will be Out of the darkness we will rise and sing Let's declare church He is faithful He is glorious And He is Jesus And all my hope is Song 
Jesus, hey? He's good. He's good. Just continue this morning, church. Let's just reflect on the cross and his sacrifice for us as we worship.
you deserve the praise. Sing that again. Worthy is your name. And worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. And worthy is your name. wonder if I just invite you just to tell him this morning what you're grateful for. You can do it loud, you can do it quiet, you can do it under your breath, but just use your voice and just thank you God, you are worthy God because you saved me. You're worthy God for healing. You're worthy God for giving me connection and community. Thank you God. Everything I need Christ my 
decided. I had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross, the cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. I say again. I have. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning. serve a God that we can declare that everything, did you hear that word? Everything I need is in you. Everything. Everything I need is in you, Jesus. We're blessed people to serve a living God who is alive and with us. Amen. Amen. Welcome to church this morning, friends. It's great to see you. I have an invitation for everyone in the house this morning for this week that you're not going to want to miss. Okay, so are you, are you ready? You kind of almost want to get your diaries out for this one. There's an invitation going on this week that everyone in the house is going to want to be at. Have I got your attention? Yeah, thank you. Here's the invitation. Jesus would like to meet with you. <laughs> That's the invitation. Jesus would like to meet with you this week. He'd like to show you, bring from screen and singing of worship into reality that he is everything you need. He would like to bring from screen into your reality that he is your lover, your provider, your beautiful one who walks with you. And so I invite you this week to meet with him. We serve a God who is present in us. And I was reading Romans this week, and apparently he's present in everything around us. So there's no reason why we can't meet with him. So I extend the invitation to you. Meet with Jesus sometime this week. Be really deliberate about a time and a place and a how and a means. And then when we come back and worship next Sunday, we'll worship out of the experience of that. Did everybody hear the invitation? <laughs> I, heard, I was listening to a Christian uh, commentator this week and he was asked if he believed in Jesus, which I thought was an interesting question for a Christian commentator. And he said, no, I don't believe in Jesus. I live like he's real. I don't believe in Jesus. I live like he's real. That, that really struck me because I thought, I believe that healthy eating is good for the body, but clearly I don't live like that's real, right? <laughs> and I wonder how often do we come to church and I, I, I believe in, but do I live like he's real? And friends, I, that's the invitation. Live like Jesus is real. Good invitation? Not a condemnation, not, not any of that, just an invitation 
from Jesus to live like his will. Well, welcome. I'm not, that, that's not part of the announcements. I just wanted to share that with you. Felt that in work. Anyway, welcome. Great to be in church together. Um, the QR code's on the screen. If you're here with us the first time and you kind of want to connect further with the church, then that's kind of how you can share your details, get newsletter, encourage people, ask for prayer. That's kind of how we do our comms around here. So QR code's there. Uh, I want to invite those of you that are into um, board games... Right, who's in the board games? A bit of a show of hands. We've got a couple going on. Okay, come on. Yeah, there's a, it's like I don't want to admit it in public, but I'll be there. I'm here. No, 14th of April after the service, there's going to be um, board games out, out in the foyer there. So come and just enjoy each other and enjoy that if that's kind of a thing that you're into. On Thursdays, we have a prayer meeting here. It's been going on for 170 years, I'm told. That might be an exaggeration. Thursday afternoons at 4 o'clock, we have a prayer meeting. But we're asking the question, is that the right time to have that prayer meeting? So if, if you would kind of go, I'd love to be involved in a prayer meeting, but I, can I suggest another time or I'd like to have a, a, a conversation with someone? Dave Lakos or Meg are the ones to see. And we're just going to see whether we should adjust that time to somewhere else to see if more people are, are available to come. Friends, after the service today, you've, we've got a members meeting. So um, go down, the coffee van's going to be in the car park today. Thank you, got a little bit. Coffee van's going to be down in the car park today. Grab a free coffee and remember, don't head straight off home. Enjoy each other quickly, grab your coffee and then head back in here for the members meeting that'll take place. Um, if we just don't believe in worship and, 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 and word, but we believe in prayer in this house. So if during the service, you know, God's speaking to you about getting some prayer for something, there'll be a prayer team down this side after the service. Come and invite someone to pray with you to seek what God is speaking to you about. So take advantage of that. The offerings are on the screen there, so you can grab that. We also have these boxes that you can put money into as well. Um, they're available to you. So welcome to church. That's the announcements. David Lakos has got the word for us today. Yeah, that was not good enough. Dave Lakos has got the word for us today. And Greg's going to bring the Bible reading. We have tag team Greg's this morning. So the Bible reading is from John chapter 21, last chapter of John, uh, verses 1 to 17. And... Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the son of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, 
Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. That's really. Thank you, Greg. We come for the last time to look in the Gospel of John. And this is chapter 21, the final chapter in John's Gospel. <clears throat> um, what a wonderful, precious time we had together last weekend in our Easter celebrations. What a great time is Easter, the highlight of the year for Christian faith. We have the glorious message of death defeated and hope for eternity. What do you do after Easter is finished? I suppose the beautiful props from Easter productions are carefully stored away somewhere and the scripts of dramas or poems are carefully filed away. Maybe they can be used another time in another context. If Easter was a glorious mountain top, it can feel as if we go back to life on the lowlands. What do we do after Easter? Come to think of it, what were the first disciples of Jesus to do after Easter? Try to imagine there's no book of the Acts of the Apostles to tell us what came next. There are no letters to the, the young churches. And that's where they are in John chapter 21. They don't know the story that's going to unfold. They've seen Jesus alive from the dead. They've met him. They've talked with him. They've heard him talk about plans for what they will be doing going forward. But I don't know how much they've understood of that. What are they to do after Easter? This chapter, John's final chapter, helps us greatly. The risen Jesus means for his disciples there is fishing, there is forgiveness, there is feeding. Let me read again. I'm at the start of John chapter 21. And he tells us afterward, we, we don't know how long after the events of the previous chapter. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. We're told who the people that were there. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, We'll go with you. I'm going out to fish. Actually, how should you say that line? If this story was turned into a stage play and you were going to play the role of Peter, how would you say that line? What um, feeling would you put into it? Would it be boredom? Going out to fish. Would it be shrugging your shoulders and you don't know what else to do? Would it be just trying to go through the motions of normal life because you can't forget that just a few days beforehand you denied that you even knew Jesus? Some people are critical of Peter at this point. They feel that at, at this point he and the other disciples should have had a strong sense of purpose and mission as servants of Jesus. I think that view of it may be a bit harsh but maybe there is a bit of a sense they're not sure what to do next. <clears throat> so my first heading is the risen Jesus means fishing, but not fishing in the way they expected. If we continue reading in verse 3, they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. 
We might wonder, if they did not recognise Jesus, maybe it's the dim light of early morning, why would they follow the advice of someone that they thought was a random stranger? Well, it's hard to know. They were fairly close to shore. Maybe they might think someone on the shore had a, had a better view of the water than they did from in the boat, but that's only a guess. Luke, in his gospel, tells us about another time when Jesus provided a miraculous catch of fish for his fishermen followers. That was near the start of his public ministry. And at that time, Jesus had said to Peter, from now on, you will fish for people. Sorry, I'm coming a bit unattached here. <laughs> now, John calls the miracles of Jesus signs. And like signs or signposts, they, they point to something more. They point to a further lesson to learn. He does not explicitly say this miracle was a sign. But isn't it interesting to see what comes together in this scene? Jesus had told them they would fish for people. And now he is soon to leave them and return to heaven. He's taught them about that in the upper room. And since the resurrection, he has said a bit about the mission that he will leave with them. And what do we see here? He provides a huge catch of fish after their efforts produce nothing. Now, I don't like reading things into scripture that are not really there, but I do notice it's the risen Jesus who provides the fish, who, so to speak, brings the fish into the net for his disciples to gather. If their mission from now on is going to be a new kind of fishing, that is fishing for people in the name of Jesus, well, then in a real sense, the fish are brought in not by the work of the disciples, but by the bounty and the power of the risen Jesus. What a great encouragement for those disciples if they contemplate the task of kingdom fishing that is ahead of them. Now, you and I are not the apostles, but isn't it the most natural thing in the world that people who have been hooked by Jesus have a heart to see others come too. And what a wonderful thing to see that Jesus, in his power and generosity, draws the fish into the net. This is not to say the efforts of disciples are irrelevant or pointless. Far from it. But what a comfort to know that ultimately it's Jesus who brings the fish for us to gather. I am so thankful that the mission of God's kingdom does not ultimately depend on my weak, wobbly efforts, but rather the resurrection power and generosity of Jesus. But this new mission of serving Jesus may be problematic for Peter. One of the last times we saw him in John's Gospel was when some people questioned him and he swore three times he did not belong with Jesus. And the other Gospels tell us he wept bitterly when he realised that was exactly what Jesus had said he would do. And I imagine he would be wondering now whether it might be a case of three strikes and you're out. What an awful burden of guilt and shame to be carrying. He had been so bold in promising he would never abandon Jesus. He would never let him down, even if the other disciples caved in. I wonder whether you've ever experienced something like this. I know I have. I recall a conversation, it's probably 50 years ago, with a couple of other boys at school. It's not... It's not that I denied that I knew Jesus, but I, I fluffed a golden opportunity to tell them that I do belong with Jesus. Is there a way back from failing Jesus in such a dismal way? Will Jesus want to use you on his team after you failed him? 
Well, verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. If I were Peter in that boat, I think I might have hung back in shame after what I, remembering what I'd done. But Peter is desperate to get to Jesus as quick as he can. Maybe the miraculous catch of fish that he's just seen, perhaps that has given him confidence that Jesus is for him, not against him. But then see what comes after they've all had breakfast. I'm jumping to verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. <clears throat> Sometimes preachers point out that when Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? There are actually two different words for love in the original language. In, uh, between the first and the third time he asks, I think it is. And some say that's significant, as if Jesus is testing the depth of Peter's love for him, as if to say, do you love me or are you just friendly towards me? That might be what's going on here, but with the best help that I could get from the Bible scholars, I, I don't think that's really the point here. I believe what distressed Peter was not that Jesus used a different word for love. John says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. It looks like Jesus is reminding him that in that earlier scene, when he was asked three times, he had said three times that he did not know Jesus, he did not belong with him. How painful now for him to have to answer this question three times. There's so much in this brief conversation, but perhaps the biggest thing is that it shows here Peter is fully forgiven and reinstated by Jesus. So my second heading, we had fishing, now forgiveness. We know he's fully forgiven and reinstated because Jesus commissions him with a great task. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. More about that task shortly. If Peter was worried or afraid, there might be no way back from what he'd done recently. How surely his fears are laid to rest here. And what good news this is for any follower of Jesus who knows they've let him down or who knows their relationship with him needs to be healed and restored. And the promise of forgiveness and healing and restoration from Jesus is also for you if you've not yet come to be one of his people. I think of some of the people in the Bible who would certainly have been struck from the story if it were true that you can't come back from failure. There was Jacob, the cheat, in the book of Genesis. Uh, King David, the adulterer and in effect, murderer. There was Saul, the persecutor of Christians. All of them who had drastically, miserably failed were forgiven, reinstated. And Peter himself, the book of Acts, tells how boldly and eagerly he served Jesus in the years that followed. Forgiven, restored, reinstated, commissioned to serve. How wonderful is this mercy of Jesus. Something else in this brief conversation that I think is wonderfully profound, 
the vital question that Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? For this man who is about to be given the responsibility of, of serving and leading among the people of God, the question from Jesus is, do you love me? It seems to me Jesus makes a connection here between loving him and caring for his people. So on the one hand, if you love Jesus, well, one obvious thing you'll do is care for his people. And these words of Jesus remind me of other places where he identifies himself closely with his people, particularly with those of his people that we might consider least important. For example, when he said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. If you love Jesus, one obvious thing you'll do is care for his people. And this also suggests if you love Jesus, but you're not interested in being with his people, you're not interested in gathering with his people or serving his people, then something has gone wrong somewhere. Uh, maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you have not realised how much Jesus values that his people would be cared for. Now, as I said, we are not the apostles. We're not all leaders among the people of Jesus. But surely the principle is the same. If you love Jesus, one obvious thing that you'll do is care for his people in whatever way God gives you gifts and opportunities. And then another thing, I think, as Jesus asked Peter this question here, these words of Jesus suggest the vital, I call it qualification, for serving among his people is to love him, to love him. Of course, we want leaders among God's people to be gifted, to be well-trained, to be competent, people of good character. But I take from this, this is the bit you can't leave out. This is the bit you can't just work around, to love Jesus. Now, as I was preparing I wondered whether I ought to say something about what it actually means to love Jesus. Because it occurs to me, for us human beings, it is highly unusual to have a personal relationship of love with someone you can't see or touch or converse with audibly. Well, occasionally, maybe, Christians have the experience of conversing with him audibly. But it's a, an extremely unusual relationship. But then, once we take into account that unusualness I think we know what it means to have a personal relationship with someone that you love. In this case, it's a relationship with someone far greater than you who nevertheless does want to have a relationship with you. As Greg reminded us, he wants to meet with you. Loving him means loving to be with him, loving to spend time communicating. I think loving him means receiving his gifts with gratitude. Loving him means trusting his promises. Loving him means seeking to honour his greatness and goodness. As he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now I'm already talking about my third point. The risen Jesus means for his disciples there is feeding. Uh, I, I guess I was seduced by the possibility of having three headings that all started with the same letter. But what I mean is the risen Jesus gives his disciples the great task of feeding his lambs, caring for his sheep. This image of calling leaders among God's people shepherds of his sheep is a rich theme through the scriptures. King David was called the shepherd of his people. I think of places where the prophets uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel both brought powerful messages about shepherds, about God's displeasure with the corrupt shepherds of his people and promising to give them the kinds of shepherds that they really needed. And who could forget just a few weeks ago as Pastor Georgina talked to us, we heard the claim of Jesus to be the good shepherd. It's a wonderful image of leadership among God's people. It speaks of nurture and care, patience with the weak and injured. 
So, did Peter get the message? Did Peter get the message here as Jesus called him to feed and take care of the sheep? There's a beautiful piece of evidence that he did. In his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, he writes, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing I guess because you love Jesus, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Once again, you and I are not the apostles. They had a a special foundational role in the story of Jesus' church, yet the task and privilege of caring within his family, shepherding Jesus' people continues. If you love Jesus, one obvious thing you will do is to seek to care for others among his people. Are you keen to serve and care for his people? It, it does not have to be in a, in a role that has a job title attached to it. There are many opportunities to serve. And maybe if you're wondering about this, you can ask him to open your eyes to a need or opportunity where you could serve. So what do you do when Easter is finished? Well, certainly you can go home from Easter and say, Jesus is alive from the dead, therefore I have sure hope for eternity. What a great thing that is to have that hope and assurance. But John, in this final chapter of his gospel, fills out the picture some more, I think, most helpfully. Since Jesus is alive from the dead, for his disciples there is forgiveness. There is fishing. There is feeding. There is forgiveness. Have you discovered, as Peter did, the joy, the relief, the sense of freedom in receiving forgiveness from Jesus. Whether it's the first time you're asking him or the 10,000th time, there is forgiveness. And it's not just some kind of grudging forgiveness that keeps reminding you how badly you failed, but you can know you are restored and reinstated and given the opportunity to serve on his team. And then I think the other two, the other, my other two F words flow out of that forgiveness. Do you have a heart for fishing? That is, seeking to gather others in for Jesus. I remember hearing a gentleman speak who was a senior leader in uh, a mission agency. He was, you might say, a kind of a recruiter of missionaries. He was talking about what he's looking for in people uh, who are to be missionaries. And he said, Just the other week, my grandchildren were sick with colds and flu. And if you went anywhere near them, they were coughing and they were sneezing all over you. Um, They couldn't help themselves. They were just infectious and they were sharing. He said, I'm looking for people who are infectious for Jesus. People who can't help just spreading it. The fact that they belong to Jesus and that it's great to belong to Jesus and they want you to consider belonging to Jesus. Do you have a heart for fishing? I long that God would grow me to be more infectious for Jesus. And do you have a heart for feeding his sheep? They are very precious to him and he invites you, he calls you to serve and care for them as you have opportunity. Let's pray now. Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice in your victory over death. And we are so thankful that your victory over death gives us hope and assurance, but gives us the opportunity to serve you, to serve with you, to know that we are forgiven, to serve with you in drawing others 
or reaching others whom you are drawing and caring for your people. In your risen power, by your Holy Spirit, please equip us for these great tasks, we pray. We rejoice in your victory over death. Amen. There's a beautiful, beautiful invitation from David this morning to go deeper with Jesus, to uh, find, I guess, the uh, areas of our lives, to discover them, to hear from him afresh of those things where we uh, maybe have something that's not surrendered to him and to uh, make the choice this morning to, uh, to surrender that thing over to him. So I'll remind you uh, as we sing that there's a place of prayer over here and we have a prayer team in the church and... Uh, if you feel the Spirit uh, putting something on your heart this morning and you're not sure what to do with that, how to work it through, you're not sure if you're hearing clearly, um, that's why we have a prayer team. We can bring what we think the Spirit's saying to us into community and have some trusted people in the church to help us work through that. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that, that invitation this morning. Uh, please take it up if you feel the Spirit putting something on your heart. Um, let's worship Him as we uh, wrap up our meeting this morning. Hey? Feel free to stand if you'd like. There's a name that mirrors mountains. Cause out highways through the seas. Seen his power and rebels battles right in front of me. There's a faith that stands defiant. Sends Goliath to his knees. I've seen his praise. Unravel shackles right off my feet. Cause that's the power of your name. Just a mention makes a way. Giants fall and strongholds break. And there is healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grave. That's the power of right, the mighty name of Jesus. There's a hope. There's a hope that calls out courage. In the furnace unafraid The kind of daring expectation That every prayer I make Is on an empty grave Cause that's the power of your name Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break Spirit break. 
great week church god bless you don't forget the price prayer don't forget the coffee van and don't forget the members meeting have a blessed week god bless you